the ninth chapter, please. Ninth chapter of Isaiah. I want you to go with me to verses 6 and 7, please. Isaiah, ninth chapter, verses 6 and 7. Do you have it? All right, let's go. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. Hallelujah. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform it. In other words, the burning desire of the Lord is to perform this very thing, that he shall place the government, all the government upon his shoulders. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, there's something you want to say to us tonight. Holy Spirit, I acknowledge you. I acknowledge you in my heart. I acknowledge you in your mission. I acknowledge you in my need tonight to have your unction and anointing so that this word will produce life. Spirit of the living God, come upon me. I thank you for the blood. I thank you that I'm justified before Jesus Christ, my Lord, and I stand here in the merits of his blood only. No other plea but the justification of his blood, sanctified by grace and mercy. Lord, we need to hear the word. We thank you for what we've heard today. Now minister life to us. Quicken me by your Holy Spirit. Holy Ghost, unless you touch this word, unless you make it life, there's no purpose to it. So do it now, Father. First in me, let it be the word that makes my heart alive and quickens me, and then help to quicken this body. In Jesus' name, amen. The government shall be upon his shoulder. Now, if you think for one moment that an ungodly Congress, an ungodly Supreme Court, ungodly judges, ungodly leaders in Washington, D.C., are going to keep God out of America and de-Christianize this nation, you can forget it. If you believe that, you don't know your Bible. The government shall be upon his shoulder. You may be sitting here tonight thinking and, and worrying about the nations of the world that are trying to push God out. Australia says they won't, don't want to be called a nation under God. They want it to be a godless society. But just when they think they have pushed him out, a revival breaks out. Just when communism thinks that they have de-Christianized everybody and they have driven the Bibles out, they've driven God out of their government and out of their life and out of their schools, what happens? The walls come down, the Holy Ghost begins to breathe, just huffs and puffs a little bit, and suddenly Jesus is the most popular man in Russia today. The most popular topic of conversation. Glory to God. Isaiah said the government shall be upon his people of the increase. It's not going to be a decrease in government, but an increase in government and peace. There shall be no end. Here's what the Bible says. The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord. If you want to know where it's going, you want to know what's going to happen in the future, let the homosexual scream. Let all of the ungodly say that this is no longer a Christian nation. Let them do what they want to push God out of schools and out of our courts and everything else. Just about the time they think they have won it, the Lord comes along and says, the kingdoms are mine and his Christ and he shall reign forever and ever. Isaiah 40:15 says, behold, the nations are as a drop of a bucket and they're, uh, they are counted as the small dust of the balance. All nations before him are as nothing, and they are counted to him as less than nothing in vanity. He who sits on the circle of the flood, he who sits on the circle of the earth, he who has all power and dominion laughs at these puny efforts of man to keep God out of their nations and out of their society. Thank God just when they think they have accomplished it, God just has to breathe. The Holy Spirit just moves and all the dry bones come to life. Amazing. God laughs, he says, at their efforts to keep him out. But you see, this passage really goes far beyond God uh, making Christ the ruler of all nations. It goes beyond that. This has to do with our hearts. 
This has to do with the kingdom of God inside us, not the nations of the world alone. That, that has to be taken for granted. God, we, all the scripture says that God's going to rule and reign. He's going to put all his enemies under his footstool. He's going to be God and Lord of all. So we don't have to fret about that. We can grieve over the sins of our nation. We can preach repentance. But we've got to keep that ultimate vision in mind that God said, in the last hour, I'm going to conquer all. You are going to be more than conquerors. But this has to do with our hearts. The government of our hearts shall be upon his shoulder. Hallelujah. That means that he has the responsibility of ruling and reigning in my heart. He has the responsibility. This ought to be the greatest news you've ever heard. That you don't have to rule and reign your own life. That, that you don't have the power to rule and reign. You don't have the power to overcome sin. You don't have it in you. Try as you will. God will let you honestly fall flat on your face. He will let you fail time and time again until you give up your, uh, raise up your hands, throw it up in despair and say, Oh God, I can't do it myself. I can't get victory over my sin. There is no power in me and you are driven to this truth that the government is on his shoulder and not your shoulder. You cannot do it in your own strength and in your own power. Hallelujah. Great news that I don't have to be uh, the, the counselor of my heart. I don't have to be the ruler of my heart. He has the government of my life on his shoulder. The implications are incredible. The implications are unbelievable. Remember in Acts 3.26, the scripture says, God raised up his son Jesus, then he sent him to bless you and turning every one of you from his iniquity. Now stop and think about that, what it means. God raised his own son, then turned around as soon as he brought the blood into the Holy of Holies. The moment he took power and authority over the sin, flesh, the devil, he was all victorious. Then that victorious Savior, his spirit, his very spirit, that's why Jesus said, I'm going to come back to you. I'm going, but I'll be back. His spirit came back. God sent his spirit into your heart and he was sent for a mission to turn you away from your iniquities. That's his job. That's the ministry of the Holy Spirit to turn us away, to make us hate our sin, to make us miserable so you please in our sins. He, I'll tell you what, the Holy Ghost when he comes, he can give you Holy Ghost miserables. He can give you Holy Ghost miserables that are beyond description. Hallelujah. In my lifetime, I've never been more miserable than when I failed God. And the Holy Ghost does that because of His great love for us. Hallelujah. God sent His Spirit into our hearts to do what? The Holy Ghost, when He comes, is not a clown. He's not a clown. And you can't divorce Him from His mission. You can only consider the work of the Holy Spirit in your heart according to the mission and other the ministry of the Holy Spirit that God gave to Him. Now, I want you to follow me on this, if you will, please. God sent him into our hearts to take control, that the government would be on his shoulder. That's exactly what he's saying. And in the increase of his government, the more you give him the reins, the more peace that he gives you. There's be an increase of peace when you give him the reins. That's why it said of the of this government, there should be no end. And of this peace, there shall be no end. Can you imagine the same spirit that was there in creation that created the heavens and the earth and the galaxies? The same spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead? The same spirit that raised all of those bones in the valley, uh, of Ezekiel's valley? That is the self same spirit that God has sent into your heart and mind to take control of our lives He's counselor, that means he's going to guide us and lead us. He's prince of peace, that means he's going to give us peace that passeth all understanding. But he is going to take the reins. He's going to sit on a throne in our hearts. And folks, that's exactly, we say, well, what is our part? God sent him, he's going to direct us and lead us, give us power over sin. What is our part? Our part is the hardest part. We think it's easy, but it's not. And that is to fully surrender and by faith, believe that 
He knows the way out. He knows the way over. He has the power. Is there anybody here tonight that would doubt the Holy Ghost has the power to overcome every mountain in your life, every temptation in your life? Would you believe that God Almighty, through the Holy Spirit, could live and abide in you? And sent for this very specific purpose is to turn you away from your iniquity? Folks, you can stand by faith on what God said He's come to do. You can't divorce Him from His mission. God said, I'm sending Him into your heart to do a job, to do a work. His ministry is to turn you from your sins. Hallelujah. That's a wonderful encouragement to my heart. Romans 9, 5, Christ came who is Lord of all. He is absolutely Lord of all. Now, folks, how long will the Holy Spirit abide in the life of a Christian who, who would allow him to come and just idle in back roads of our mind? There are Christians that claim to be baptized with the Holy Spirit who have, they say, I have the Holy Spirit abiding in me. The Holy Spirit will not come just to be idle. He will not come to vacation. He will not come to entertain. He will not come to do what you think he ought to do. You can beg him and feed him all you want. He's not going to do anything other than the mission that God sent him. You can't divorce him from his mission. You can't understand him unless you know his mission. What? Why did God send him? He's counselor. He's comforter. We know all of that. But he has come to give us authority and power. The Holy Ghost, God sent him. Jesus... First of all, the Holy Spirit is a gift to His Son. The Son gave Him that gift. So that both the Father and the Son, it is said, sent Him to us. And He abides here. Now, folks, you have got to understand this and understand it well. The mission of the Holy Spirit is to preserve a bride. That this bride would not backslide. That this bride would not be like the children of Israel and die in some corrupt wilderness amidst the snakes. His whole coming is to keep us from doing and happening what happened to the children of those who were in the wilderness, who went into the promised land, they backslid, and they lost and broke the covenant. God sent the Holy Ghost in these last days. They did not have the Holy Ghost abiding in them. The Holy Ghost moved occasionally on individuals. The Spirit would come upon men. There would be theophanies. You would, you would see God in certain instances showing His glory through the Spirit. But the Spirit the last days has been sent to every believer, to every one of us. We have indwelling in us everything we need to stay pure, to obey God, to get victory over every besetting sin. Everything we need having to do with righteousness and godliness and holiness is in us. You don't have to look somewhere else. He is not in the heavens somewhere. He is not seated at the right hand of the Father, the Scripture said. He has come to abide. He's here on this earth. You tell me the devil is going to be busy doing his job in the hearts of his people while the Holy Ghost is going to be idle in the hearts of God's people? How long will the Holy Spirit stay with you? If you will not allow him to do his work, if you will not acknowledge him, if, if, if you just... Imagine him to be some kind of a mystical being or presence that is just there, easy on the mind. And, and occasionally, if we're downcast or we have to bury somebody, he's there to give you a little comfort when you're bereaved. Or he's there when you're in some crisis and he will help you then. No, I'll tell you what, the Holy Spirit... I, I agonize in my heart over what I see the charismatic movement making the Holy Ghost out to be. As if he, all he does is, is, is try to inflame your passions and your emotions and jerk your body around. He didn't come to jerk your body around. He came to give you power and authority over sin and the devil and the flesh. Saul chased David until he came to Ramah where Samuel was having a revival and the glory of God came down. The Spirit came on Saul and his body was jerked around. He was thrown into the ground and he fell. Didn't change a thing in him. 
Because that was not the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was trying to deal with the sin in his life and he wouldn't yield. He went back out unchanged. The Holy Spirit wants to change you. The Holy Spirit's trying to keep you preserved as the bride of Jesus Christ. And that's why when he comes, he will convict you of sin. He will put, if you have the Holy Ghost in you, abiding, the Holy Ghost is going to bring the Word to you. And that Word's going to convict you. That Word's going to shake you. And he does that to preserve you. Hallelujah. Oh, I love to sit under Holy Ghost preach. I love to be convicted by the Word. And I like what Pastor Carter said. I get very concerned that there would be something in my life that I am not allowing the Holy Ghost to expose, that I'm holding off something that I'm protecting from the light and the glare of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. So many of us are like Hagar. She's in the desert. She's thirsty and she thinks she's going to die of thirst. And she's given up her son. She's put him under a little bush and stand, waits for him to die so she can bury him. And with stones throw away, there's a well of water. And the Bible says, and the Lord opened her eyes and she saw a well. And cool, refreshing water was there all the time. The Holy Ghost is a well of living water springing up. And some of you are so thirsty you think you're going to die. God has to open your eyes to who He is in you. Hallelujah. He's a well of living water. Living, bringing life to us. But how hopeless so many believers are today. So blind to the provision Christ has made for our overcoming life. Folks, the, as I've told you, we have over 700,000 people on the mailing list. And the despair that we hear now, the absolute uh, depression, emptiness, lack of fulfillment, marriages that are in trouble... And, and, and people bound by habits they can't seem to break, serve the Lord year after year and never get to victory, cry rivers of tears and make a thousand promises and steal without victory, sing and shout and praise the Lord, go right out and fight a losing battle with some over, some besetting sin. I, re, I, I told you once, I remind you of a young man that we took into Teen Challenge years ago, and he told me of his hopeless helpless struggle against uh, drugs. He wanted to serve the Lord, but he said, I've, I've got to lick this. I'm, I don't want to go into a program. I, I, I don't need that. I said, if I could just lock myself for three or four days in my room, I'll, I'll kick it and I won't need it anymore. He got a chain, chained himself to a radiator, steam radiator. He said, I'm staying here, chained to this radiator till I get victory. I'm going to beat this habit if it's the last thing I do. Changed himself to that so he couldn't get away. Was there about 12 hours and a rage of desire came over him, just overpowered him, and he couldn't fight it, and he couldn't get away. He pulled and pulled until literally he said there was blood coming from one of the, where he was chained. And, and just an absolute rage of, of lust for his, uh, his heroin. He yanked the thing right off the wall, right off the floor, broke the pipe. And you know those things, what are they, 40, 50 pounds? And he carries it on his back to his pusher. Walking down the street, he said, Brother Dave, I walk for blocks with that radiator on my back, chained to it. And then I knew that I couldn't fight it on my own. And many of you are just like that. You think if you could just have time away from it or you move somewhere. You go someplace. Folks, you can't run from the devil. You can't hide anywhere when you are bound. Not on your own strength, not on your own power. I'm reminded of the Christian young lady. <clears throat> She's just out of her teens. She's been having an affair with a married man, supposed to be a Christian. And she knows it's wrong and she's cried and she's begged God to deliver her. And she, she, she wants to break it. She's tried to break it. And she says, every time I try, there'll be a telephone call from this man and he has a strange power over me and I can't say no. She said, I fear exposure. She's, she's afraid now that she's going to ruin uh, something, uh, 
having to do with that man's family and his children. And, and he, she knows in her heart the man really doesn't love her. But she is, she is bound. She is chained. And she cries and she says, I want out of this. And she doesn't seem to know where the power is. And she's in total despair. Total despair. I don't know who I may be describing sitting here right now under a similar uh, kind of situation. You're, you're in a, an affair. You're in a situation. You're in something that has you bound. You have tried. You have cried a river of tears. You've, you've done everything you know how humanly. And you're at the point where so I, I can't do it. Some of you that were on heroin or on another drug or, or you were on a, a medical drug. You could have been on Valium. You could have been on any prescribed drug. I've, I've, we get letters from pastors' wives who, who, who were so in despair about their marriage, the doctor puts them on Valium or some other uh, sedative type drug, and, and they, they tremble, they cry. There's no hope. Literally, uh, horrible stories of those who have been addicted, who weep and cry. Larry Flint editor of that terrible porno magazine called Penthouse. I saw an article in the paper yesterday. Larry Flint uh, was paralyzed from the waist down. An accident, and he was paralyzed. And when after being paralyzed, some Christians came to him, and he, he testified. In fact, it had been all over the nation, the story of Larry Flint had been saved. But there was something that held this man and he couldn't break it. And he went right back to his old ways, never broke from pornography. It had such a hold on Larry Flint. And in the paper the other day, he, he said, those born-againers are a bunch of crazies. They're all crazy. Here's a man who's gone back because he could find no power, no authority in his life. Nothing to, to, to deliver him from the power and the absolute the deceitfulness of sin. There are Christians sitting here tonight whose God is their belly. Now, folks, please don't laugh when I talk about addiction to food because it's not a laughing matter. There are some people who are in depression. There are some people who are, have their emotions so out of control that the only thing they knew, food is their drug. Food is their drug. They run to the refrigerator. They eat and they eat and they eat. Not because they need it. Food has become their God. The God of their belly, the apostle says. Whose God is their belly. There's some of you sitting here right now, you're addicted to food. You have an addiction. You don't know how to get out of it. And folks, don't think it's a light thing. It's a very serious thing because this body is a temple of the Holy Ghost and many people are absolutely destroying the temple of the Holy Ghost. And if you're sitting here tonight and you're addicted to food, you need to be delivered. You say, oh, that, that, that's all right with you, Brother Dave, because uh, you've always been rather slim and you don't have... Everybody knows I eat just to live. I don't live to eat, I just live to eat. I wish we could do it with pills. I'd take a, a, a carrot pill and a spinach pill, and I, I would do it because food has never been attractive to me. There are some people that, 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 that dislike food. I'm not saying it's wrong to like food. I'm saying it's wrong to become a glutton. And, and you use food to try to sedate your troubled mind. It's a sin. It's just as bad as heroin. It can kill you just as quickly. I'm telling you, though, that there's not a single one of us that are ever going to get victory in our lives until we understand that that victory has to come through the ministry of the Holy Spirit alone. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. You're strong not in yourself, but in the power of the Lord and in His strength. Now, the government of the Holy Spirit has to be evidenced probably more than any other area in our life in the emotions, in the emotions. There's some of you here tonight, your emotions are not under the government of the Holy Spirit. You're not being governed in your emotions. Folks, I've never in my lifetime seen so many sad-looking Christians. 
Absolutely, totally depressed. I agree with Pastor Carter 100% that on the job and in your home, you need to be real. Sometimes you need to express. Even on the job, if, if you've gone through a terrible crisis and you sit at the desk, it's, it's, it's human to cry. It's human to show your emotions. But folks, listen to me very closely now where I'm taking you through the Word of the Lord and the Spirit. There are not many happy, fulfilled Christians anymore in the church. Some of you sit here in the service tonight. Your marriage is in turmoil. And you're not happy. And in the flesh, you're not fulfilled. There are numbers. I just got word that recently of three divorces in Noah having to do with those that attend this church. Two who were married, two couples that were married in this church. And within a year, divorced. And some of you sitting here now, some wives that are sitting here, and you are absolutely miserable. It's affected everything around you. It's affected you. It's affected your children. It's, uh, it's, it's affected everything about you. And you have a sad countenance, and you live in despair and depression. And if you had your way, you would probably say, I'd rather be single at this time. I'd rather be alone. I don't want another man. I don't want another man. I just want to be alone because I can't handle this anymore. Don't have to look around. There's a sadness. There's a lack, there's a sense of, a lack of fulfillment in, in many Christians. Even in their countenance, you see an emptiness. They come to church and get a temporary reprieve through worship and praise, but they go home and they go on the job and they are down. I, I had a woman come to me recently. She said, my husband's no good. My kids are no good. My boss is a devil. And the neighbors hate me. She went on and on. Everything was bad. I said to myself, please don't tell anybody you're a Christian. Please don't let the name of Jesus fall on your lips. Can you imagine the double grief that we cause the Holy Spirit when he has announced to the whole world through these pages that he has been sent of the Father to comfort, that he has been given a ministry to govern our lives. And then we stand before a wicked world looking for hope. And we appear on the job as though the Holy Ghost is weak. We appear on the job as if the Holy Spirit has no guidance in us. We appear as lost and helpless and the people around us who are bound by sin and have no place to turn but you. First of all, the first grief because the Holy Spirit is that we do not turn to Him and His government. We do not allow Him to do His ministry. And we go in our own way sad and dejected and depressed. And then we go to the world and the world sees nothing but why should I want your Holy Ghost? Why should I want to walk your path? You're no different. I see no difference in you. You're just as down as I am. You're just as depressed as anybody on this job. Most of the people get drunk on Friday, Saturday night and, and booze around on Sunday and come in here. You look like you've been a hang, had a hangover and you were in church. What a double grief to the Holy Ghost. What a lie we tell on Him. What's the Spirit of God to do? What will he do? Is, is he just going to sit idle in the heart when we won't go to him? We won't yield to his government? We won't let him do what he's called us to do? Folks, the Bible said, if ye through the Spirit do mortify or kill the deeds of the flesh, you shall live. I don't know how he does it. I can't stand here and give you five, ten steps on how the Holy Ghost, when you depend on Him, and like a child, you turn over the government of your life and say, Lord, I'm not in control. You, Holy Spirit, you are in control. You have set up your throne in my heart. You're going to magnify Jesus in me, and you're going to have the power. You have all the power to bring down mountains. You have all the power I need, all the resources of the devil over the devil. I can't do it. Lord, I surrender. 
And I can't tell you how he does it. I don't know how he does it. Sometimes he changes circumstances. Sometimes he will just little by little take the desire away. Little by one little victory after another victory. He seems to come and just encourage you and comfort you. You did all right that time. Let's do it stronger next time. The Holy Ghost is there. Folks, how can you have a potentate of glory living in your heart and not know him? If you had the president just visit you, you'd tell everybody. You've got a bigger man living in you. You've got a bigger potentate in you and he lives with you. <laughs> Folks, the reason we are not living in victory in the church today is because we do not give the Holy Spirit the acknowledgement, the trust, and the submission. You have every right to go to the Holy Ghost. Every day I get up, first thing I do, I acknowledge my Father. I acknowledge Jesus. I acknowledge the Holy Ghost. I worship the Holy Ghost. He is God. I worship Him. And I say, Holy Ghost, I thank you that you have everything I need to get through this day. The devil can come against me and harass me, but you're going to raise up a standard against him. Every mountain I face, you're going to level that mountain. Holy Ghost, I trust in you. I talk to the Holy Ghost all day long. That's what Paul, there, there's a scripture. It says, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Now, we've got the first two pretty good. The grace of the Lord we understand, and the love of God we preach and understand some bit of. But what, how, how many of us know anything about this, the communion of the Holy Ghost? Communion. That's to sit down and have a heart-to-heart talk. That's just to talk, converse. Do you know you can be as intimate with the Holy Ghost as you can be with anybody? I'm so glad I have him to talk to. Some people ask why I don't get, I've not been, uh, in, in the past, in the last years especially, especially since I've been in New York, a lonely city, but folks, <clears throat> only a few times, uh, loneliness had come on because I have learned. You say, who's your best friend? The Holy Ghost. Because he doesn't speak of himself, he, he, he teaches Jesus to me. And he tells me if I'll just listen to him, that's called walking in the Spirit. Walking in the Spirit is just simple. Just tell him, just doing what he tells you. Getting to know him. Talking to him. And you say, Holy Ghost, if you don't help me, I'm about to slip out and do something I shouldn't do. Holy Ghost, unless you tell me what to do here now, I'm depending on you. I'll do what you tell me. And if you go like that, he is obligated to tell you. He said, there's going to be a voice behind you saying, go here. Still small voice is going to be there. Hallelujah. Do you trust him? <laughs> oh, how we have, we have misappropriated and, and made the Holy Ghost out to be some kind of an emotional manifestation of the flesh. I'll tell you, there are times that you talk to him, he can make you awful happy. He can make you feel so saved, so secure. You have peace like a river. He'll tell you things about the future that make you shout. Even when the devil's trying to lie over here, the Holy Ghost out shouts him in your heart. And the Holy Ghost, when you have the enemy trying to put something in your ears from outside here... And the devil's trying to yell at you, the Holy Ghost, very quietly and very surely says, that's a lie. That's a lie. Don't believe it. Don't buy it. You're under the blood. Stand on the blood. You're not going to go down, the Holy Ghost says. Because he said, now unto him who is able to keep you from falling, who is him? The Holy Ghost. Now unto him, the Holy Ghost, who is able to keep you from falling and present you faultless, blameless before the glorious presence. Hallelujah. 
Holy Spirit. We are changed into the same image, His image, from glory to glory, even by the Spirit. We're changed by the Spirit. Ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And then ye shall be witnesses unto me. Folks, so many of us have become unworthy witnesses. He says, what, what, you know what this whole verse is trying to accomplish for us? It's saying, when the Holy Ghost has come upon you, there is in you a power to make you the kind of witness you should be. That, that witness is not just being able to quote the four spiritual laws. It's not just being able to go to Africa, China, India, and preach. Because a lot of people go to China, India to preach who have not been good witnesses. Because they didn't know who they were in Christ. And many of them came back discouraged. The witness that the Lord needs in the last days is that even though you're human, and you suffer just like everybody else, you go through times of turmoil, depression, and everything else, you have learned a secret before you go to the job. And even on the job, when the enemy comes in like a flood, you have some place to go. You have someone with you. Jesus sent him to abide with you because Jesus couldn't walk with you. Jesus is not here except by his spirit. He's a man in glory. Hallelujah. He's there interceding for us before the heavenly father. But we have now within us. He is in me right now. He's speaking through me into your heart. He's there with you right now to give you ears to hear what I'm saying. And if you're hearing the Holy Ghost right, I'll tell you what he's telling you. You're not going to fall if you'll just trust me. If you'll just give the government over and put it on my shoulder. Take it off your shoulder, put it on my shoulder. Of the increase of my government and my peace, there shall be no end. I won't leave you. I won't forsake you. I'll stay right with you to the end. Drugs, alcohol, gambling, sexual promiscuity, depression. Fear, anxiety, all of these things that try to destroy our faith. Is he not able? Is he not able to overcome in our behalf? This, this is not going to register on your mind. It's not going to have any impact when you walk out of here. Unless right now when I'm preaching, you're asking in your spirit. You're right now praying, Holy Ghost, come now. Let me receive this. Let me hear it in my heart. Simply this, the Holy Ghost in you, and you can't be a child of His without the Holy Ghost in you. Do you understand that? He said, if you're not Christ, you have none of me. Please, hear it before I close. I want it to go deep into your spirit. God has given you everything you need to overcome depression, fear, guilt, anxiety, emptiness. You say, well, brother, what about my marriage? Let me tell you about it. How much time have you been spending while your husband's been to work? You, you have a marriage that is in trouble? How much time are you spending alone allowing the Holy Spirit to heal your spirit Allowing the Holy Spirit to give you fulfillment that that man can't give you anyhow. He never will and he never could. You expected it out of him, but he can't give it to you. I would tell you now, there's no human being in the world that can help you. There's no human being in the world that can meet that need that's deep in your heart. I, I heard a ph philosopher on Thursday on the radio, is in my car, a modern philosopher, he said, there are no more happy marriages on in, in the world today. There's only two kinds of marriages. Those who still work at it and those who've given up working. In other words, you have to work at it. Oh, yes, you do. You have to work at it. But I'll tell you something. Hear me, please. I don't care how good your marriage is. There's going to come a time that that need in you, that crying inner voice, no human being, no pastor, no teacher, no psychologist, no husband, no wife, no children can meet. Only the Spirit of God. So I advise you to get alone with him. Spend a lot of time. Get to know the Holy Ghost. Get to know him. 
and get satisfied so that when that husband comes along and treat you mean, he can't understand who you're getting your blessings from. I, I'm not trying to be indiscreet. I'm just telling you that there's a happiness in you. There's something happening. You're not expecting anything from him anymore. And you're able to give. You're able to pray for him. You're able to minister to him. You're able to have... Because God just lifts you above your marriage, above your problem. And you're able to look down on it and say, He's my all in all. He's bringing Jesus and his reality to me. I dare you, if you've got a troubled marriage. Somebody gives you $10,000 and you're going to get on a boat on one of these Queen Anne twos or whatever they are over here in the river, and you're going to have a nice 30 days with your husband alone. No kids, just you and your husband. That's going to do it? No. No. But an hour every day with him who lives and abides in you, shut in with the Holy Spirit, making Jesus real. That's it. That habit. Please quit trying to figure out where you can go and where you lock yourself in and what kind of promise you can make and what you can do, who you can talk to. Shut that phone down. I don't care if anybody talk to you five hours and talk to you through the night. You're going to feel just as bad in the morning. Problem's still going to be there. Go to the Holy Ghost. Say, Holy Spirit, my Bible says the prophet Isaiah predicted when you come, you're going to be my counselor, my prince of peace, and all the government's going to be on your shoulder. So I get it off mine, I'll put it on you. Then you begin to reach out to him in love. You allow him to woo you to your knees. You allow him to draw you away from the world and spend quality time. Now, folks, with this, I close. You can't know the Holy Ghost. You can't know His power and victory over sin until you give Him quality time. Quality time. How much time did you spend this past week in a room or just away from somebody, even in the subway or wherever you're at, just close yourself in, close your eyes, and get shut in with the Holy Ghost? Hallelujah. Is the Holy Ghost you just talking in tongues? Is the Holy Ghost you just kind of a prophecy that might give you a moment or two of relief? That's all biblical. That's all wonderful. And it's wonderful to pray in an unknown language. But folks, the most glorious thing of all is to give Him your trust. To submit to Him. Say, Lord, I'm no longer in control. I have no will of my own. Hallelujah. Do you think for a moment he's going to let you down? No. The only reason you may fall once in a while is because you're still trying to do it. The only reason you would fall is because you're not fully trusting him. But even then, he doesn't get mad at you. He doesn't give up. He's faithful. He's going to stay with you through thick and thin. He's not going to forsake you. I don't care what you're going through. The Holy Ghost is there. He's here. Isn't it wonderful? How many have the Holy Ghost living in your heart? Is he idle or is he on the throne? Is he governing or have you neglected him? Oh, folks, I never neglect him. I worked for five years with Catherine Coleman. And she taught me so much about the Holy Ghost. She'd stand behind that stage, mascara running down her face. And she had a lot of mascara. And I'd stand back, because I wanted to, anytime I see God blessing somebody, I see Jesus in somebody, I want to find out, I want to pick their brains, I want to see what it's all about, I want to hear everything. And I'd stand behind, I'd watch her, and, and if she didn't have a hanky, she'd take that curtain, just wipe her face, and she'd scream, oh God, if you don't go with me, Holy Spirit, if you don't walk out there with me, I'm not going. And she would just tremble until the Holy Spirit would come upon her. And then a smile and a peace would break out in her heart. And she'd go out there and suddenly the glory, the Lord would fill the house. Totally dependent on the Holy Spirit. We'd be driving in a car, my wife and, 
and uh, her. We'd be talking, suddenly she'd quit talking to me. She's talking to the Holy Ghost. And I kept saying, I hope she keeps her eyes on the road because she's <laughs> looking up. She talked to the Holy Ghost like he was flesh and blood, like me. She had such communion with the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Billy Graham said the same thing, that he just talks to the Holy Spirit all the time. Anyone who's been used of God. Anyone in this house that's living a victorious life is because they have this wonderful communion of the Holy Ghost. Communion with the Holy Spirit. Will you stand? Hallelujah. Holy Spirit, thank you for coming. There's a ministry of the Holy Spirit, and I want it in my life. Lord, I want it for all the people in this church, that we would submit to the ministry of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. That ministry that speaks life, that ministry that wants to commune and talk to us. Jesus, you said, my sheep know my voice. They hear when I call. That's the voice of the Spirit of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Folks, He will not lead you astray. He said, if you ask bread, He will not give you a stone. No, He won't. He said, you earthly know how to give goods. How much more, your Heavenly Father, give the Holy Spirit to them that ask. If you've been bound, you say, Brother Oaks, I've been chained long enough. I want to be free. I want to come and yield my life to the Holy Ghost once and for all. I want the Holy Ghost to take over. I want to put the government on His shoulders right now. Step out of your seat. Balcony, go to the steps on either side and come down the aisles. You feel that tug of the Holy Spirit. Don't come unless the Spirit's pulling you. You feel that tug, that's the Spirit saying, tonight you're going to be free. Tonight you're going to be changed. Hallelujah. Thank you for sending the Holy Ghost. Thank you for convicting me, Holy Ghost. I lay my sins before Jesus for the sprinkling of the blood. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you live in me. You have all power and authority. And now, by faith, I ask you to take your place. Take the government of my life. I place my life in your hands. Holy Spirit, take over. Give me power over sin. Make yourself known to me. Draw me closer to you. Let me know your voice. Lead me and guide me. Because I can't do it myself. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for bringing me to Jesus. Now just love Him now, right? Now, Lord, I love You. I worship You. I praise You and I thank You. All power and authority is given to You. Blessed be the name of the Lord. This is the conclusion of the message. 